The army of tomorrow is neither the Red Army nor the US Army. If there is to be peace, it will be secured by a multinational force that monitors ceasefires and protects human rights. Blue helmeted United Nations peacekeepers are doing just that. The Unsung New World Army, New York Times editorial, May the 11th, 1992. The public relations speech today is vociferous and charismatic. We now have a supposed global peacekeeping force of over 100,000 personnel stationed all over the world in so-called crisis points and a governing body in order to ensure all our rights are being adhered to, that there are equal opportunities for all creeds, sexes and minorities. If this is the case, then why are hundreds of millions of people 10% of the world's population still living on less than two US dollars a day. Why is there more conflict and division than before the UN's inception? And why is there a huge refugee crisis to boot with over 13 million Syrians requiring assistance? Why are so many people still homeless, especially in the third world and its global megacities? Are we not supposed to be united? Zimbabwe has thus been preoccupied. She has become a victim of the evil machinations of Western countries, namely the United States of America, who continue to apply unilateral and illegal sanctions. The Agenda 2030 is an agenda aiming at a fair globalization. I am in touch with whistleblowers. Many have come forward to me with really serious tales of mis wrongdoing and misconduct. It's about a serious problem that goes to the core of the UN's mission. There's a lot of um, horse trading that goes on behind closed doors where they say, oh, well, you will swap your vote or you do this. Or if you don't vote for us, we're going to withdraw your aid or we're going to stop sending you warplanes or whatever it might be. So it is an entirely corrupt body. In the aftermath of World War I, so-called President Woodrow Wilson of the USA advocated for a League of Nations, a collective force against individual aggressors. But the US was wary and the Senate refused to participate. The League was doomed from the outset, without a global hegemony to back it up, so its international sponsors formed the so-called Council on Foreign Relations in New York City. World War II drove the isolationists to rethink the proposal for a League of Nations and the US stood at the forefront of the picture and they became integral in the formation of the United Nations. One of the key exponents was so-called US Senator Vandenberg, an active crusader for a new foreign policy. meeting of the United Nations Organization's General Assembly, the United States delegation boards the Queen Elizabeth, Edward Stettinius, Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt, and Senators Connolly and Vandenberg will represent the United States in opening the great and hopeful meeting for world peace. But was his primary interest for the sake of humanity or political maneuvering for the United States and hidden power brokers throughout the world? Remarkably, a man whose track record was as an isolationist had suddenly turned 180 degrees and was pushing for a united agenda. He gave a speech which was designed to strike fear into the hearts of the people, that their nation would be susceptible to invasion, that their only hope was a dominant United Nations. The propaganda had already begun. No nation can immunize itself by its own exclusive action. So-called US Senator Vandenberg. Europe was quite literally in ruins and the people were divided, suffering. People felt powerless in the face of such adversity and war had ground down their spirits. There was a collective insecurity with a new fear of the Iron Curtain and it left the people desperate for a new vision. In the apparent, the concept of United Nations offered a banner of hope for a new generation. 
the United States, the world's new superpower, was now on board. Certainly peace and prosperity would prevail across the world. Right? So-called Admiral Chester Ward, a former CFR member, subsequently became a critic and clarified the real intentions of the UN Manifesto when he declared the plan is submergence of US sovereignty and national independence into an all-powerful one-world government. The machinations of the CFR agents led to the inception of the UN in 1945. Its origins were of a clandestine meeting held in the Baroque cavern of the San Francisco Opera House. 43 out of the 50 nation states that founded the UN came from the CFR, proving that it truly represented a globalist agenda. And while one of the greatest war crimes in human history was taking place, the detonation of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they duly signed up to the UN Charter. Its motto was of course to eradicate many of the above concerns and to provide a platform from which peace and tranquility would prevail on our planet. A world in which no nation could pursue illegal wars for the sake of exploiting natural resources or for political maneuvering. And how has the UN carried out their agenda over the last seven decades? Have they managed to prevent the pursuit of illegal wars for the sake of exploiting natural resources or for political positioning? Hardly. You know, 20 years ago, if you tried telling the people that the United States has entered the Middle East for oil and other valued assets, you would be called a conspiracy nut, out of touch with the geopolitics of the age. But now the public relations has been left to a so-called president, spawned out of its own democracy, whose flamboyant rants have finally shared the truth with the people. ISIS is making a tremendous amount of money because they have certain oil caps, right? They have certain areas of oil that they took away. They have some in Syria, some in Iraq. I would bomb the out of them. <laughs> I would just bomb those suckers. And that's right. I'd blow up the pipes. I'd blow up the refi I'd blow up every single inch. There would be nothing left. And you know what? You'll get Exxon to come in there in two months. You ever see these guys, how good they are, the great oil companies? They'll rebuild that sucker brand new. It'll be beautiful. And I'd ring it and I'd take the oil. And I said, I'll take the oil. Well, Lindsay and I totally agree is the oil. The oil is, uh, you know, so valuable for many reasons. It fueled ISIS, number one. Number two, it helps the Kurds because it's basically been taken away from the Kurds. They were able to live with that oil. And number three, it can help us because we should be able to take some also. And what I intend to do, perhaps, is make a deal with an Exxon Mobil or one of our great companies to go in there and do it properly. Right now it's not big. It's big oil underground, but it's not big oil up top. The much of the machinery has been shot and dead. It's been through wars, but, uh, and, and spread out the wealth. But no, we're protecting the oil. We're securing the oil. Now that doesn't mean we don't make a deal at some point. Of course, this is one of countless war crimes carried out by the United States. Where is the UN? Well, the more we dig into who and what is behind the United Nations, the more everything will make sense to you. The UN Security Council was set up in a glitzy glass skyscraper in New York City, alongside the East River through funds donated by the Zionist Rockefellers. Let us remind ourselves of the attitude of the power brokers behind the agenda. We are on the verge of a global transformation all we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. In 2000, they would craft yet another proposed national security strategy. This one published by a right-wing think tank calling itself the project for the new American century. At its core, it called on the United States to increase the military budget by up to $100 billion. 
to deny other nations the use of outer space and to adopt a more aggressive and unilateral foreign policy that would allow the United States to act offensively and preemptively in the world. The elimination of states like Iraq figured prominently in this grand vision. In their defining document, written in September of 2000, a full year before 9-11, they acknowledged that the process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one. Absent, in their own chilling words, some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. One year later, that event would arrive. Uh, the whole of Congress has been evacuated. A number of congressional, senior congressional figures are calling this America's Pearl Harbor. There are few words to describe the depth of this tragedy. It's an attack on the United States that we haven't seen really since Pearl Harbor. This is comparable to an attack on uh, Pearl Harbor. Zionist David Rockefeller statement to the United Nations Business Council, September the 23rd, 1994. It's all about control. The United Nations, although some see it as failing, is all about control. The core principle of the post-1945 system was that war was illegal unless sanctioned by the Security Council. It is this wing that decides when and where the UN, the so-called peacekeeping operation, should be deployed. When we consider the power of the council, and it is held primarily by only five key permanent member states, we can see the reality of a multitude of nation states handing over vital decision making that affects their unique sovereignty to the US and its lackeys. Ultimately, they can veto any decision they so deem fit, enabling them to prevent the adoption of any substantive resolution. These so-called nation states are namely France, China, the UK, and as we mentioned, the US and Russia. While the other 10 member states only get two years by invitation and have limited veto rights. So a so-called nation such as India with up to 16% of the world's population has no substantive voice. The unfortunate truth is, is that without even at least the passive support of the US, no initiative is likely to succeed. Should this surprise us when the US is a major fundraiser and supporter of the UN? How could nations with completely different political ideologies come together to make unanimous decisions? Is this not an indicator that any proposals would find it almost impossible to become policy? If these five nations had faith that the UN offered a real hope for global peace and justice, then why would they need to show insecurity by stockpiling 85% of military arms in the world today, including a nuclear arsenal and what they have deemed as weapons of mass destruction? A UN of arms dealers, the most disreputable yet profitable business in the world today. If we take just a cursory glance as some of the recent vetoes enacted since the fall of the Berlin Wall, the UN has been rendered virtually paralyzed by the venom of the so-called United States and the criminal Zionist entity Israel. In the run-up to the first US-led Gulf War in 1991, votes of the non-permanent members of the UN Security Council were critical. John Pilger reported, Minutes after Yemen voted against a resolution to attack the filthy government of Bani al-Abbas, Iraq, a senior American diplomat told the Yemeni ambassador, that was the most expensive no vote you ever cast. Within three days, a US aid program of 70 million US dollars to one of the world's poorest countries was stopped. And 800,000 Yemeni workers were expelled from so-called Saudi Arabia. In 2003, a new UN resolution titled 1441 was used by the criminal Bush administration to prepare the way for war. 
It was rushed through the Security Council by senior U.S. officials whose job was to urge leaders to vote with the U.S. on Iraq, the filthy government of Bani al-Abbas, or risk paying a heavy price. No doubt the fate of Yemen, following its vote against the 1991 Gulf War, was on many of the members' minds. And not so coincidentally, the second Gulf War commenced in March of 2003. Noam Chomsky made a critical point. The support for the Iraq War is in fact submission. Signers understood what the alternative would be. In systems of law, that are intended to be taken seriously, coerced acquiescence is invalid. In international affairs, however, it is honoured as diplomacy. The successive resolutions put through by the UN since 1991 have failed to bring Saddam to heel. And it's that that Mr Blair emphasised, not just in his evidence here. Well, he also went through the litany of uh, defiance of the UN and emphasized that it was no good the UN passing strong resolutions if it was then feeble in its follow-up. And so I, I don't, first of all, I don't see the inconsistency that you describe. I voted uh, for the war because I think that the uh, defiance by Saddam of the UN uh, was itself a danger to international peace and security and the authority of the UN had to be upheld. I think it was very difficult to support Resolution 1441, but not follow it through. Does the UN reveal itself as other than a facade with its laws changed to suit the interests of the US, who then bullies the other states into submission to suit their plans for a global empire? The direct outcome is clear from the mayhem in Syria, Ukraine and Myanmar, and the impotence and inaction of the UN Security Council in the face of deadlock among its five veto holders. Why would it not, when at least one global hegemony on the board usually has a special interest in perpetuating a state of war in a particular nation? China in Myanmar to create a market for their products, yet lead to an obstacle to protect the Rohingya. America with the filthy government of Bani al-Abbas as part of their empire building initiative or their project for a new American century or on the flip side, denying the implementation of ethical justice across the entire spectrum. Can't you see the killing fields of Yemen, Syria and Myanmar and the lack of challenge to the atrocities of Congo? These are just a few examples. Even beyond the veto, we see how the UN can be manipulated by the threat of financial support being withdrawn. The so-called UN Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, even removed a Saudi-led coalition from a children's rights blacklist after it faced bullying threats and pressure from Saudi Arab allies. The UN chief has criticized Saudi Arabia and its allies for resorting to, quote, undue pressure to remove them from a blacklist of child rights violators. Ban Ki-moon said the decision uh, that he decided to take a Riyadh and his partners off the list after they threatened to cut off funding for UN humanitarian programs. The UN reported through military campaigns against the so-called Houthi rebels in Yemen that the coalition was responsible for 60% of all child deaths and injuries. More than 510 children were killed by the coalition and nearly 700 wounded. The Gulf state is the fourth biggest contributor to the United Nations Relief and Works Agency after the US. The so-called governments of Kuwait and the UAE provided over 50 million US dollars. How can the UN be taken as a serious legitimate entity when it is held ransom by its members and acts as a bandit regime compromising the protection of Saudi Arabia's children for the sake of donations? Where is the confrontation against despot leaders to bring justice to their people and nations? And despite their notable failings, how is there still tacit public support for this agency, with 44% surveyed from Gallup polls in 2019 still supporting the UN? Perhaps it is down to the propagandists, who still keep people convinced in the merits of the UN. Robert Wright, an editor at New Republic, said, A world government is probably in the cards and is a good idea. 
those who work hard for world government are not presented as an advocate, but as mere analysts of natural trends. They inadvertently cast the world government in a favourable light, so public acceptance for what lies ahead is rapidly gained. The people never give up their liberties but under some delusion. Edmund Burke, 1784 If the primary function of the UN is peacekeeping, then why do we see a world verging on a state of perpetual war? Are UN peacekeepers an effective military force in themselves, or more of a thin blue line, a token of international concern? The PR speech is alluring. Peacekeeping is defined by the UN as a unique and dynamic instrument, developed by the organization as a way to help countries torn by conflict create the conditions for lasting peace. It seems the UN began its implementation of this strategy around this period with its peacekeeping missions in earnest predominantly in Africa when they formed a committee on decolonization. In the apparent they promised to help liberate black Africa from white colonial oppression, but in reality this led to recolonization with Soviet style control. In the early 1960s, so-called Belgium's King Baldwin was under pressure to give up control of the Congo and announce independence, granting power to the UN in order to prepare for independence and self-rule. Yet at the same time, the so-called Soviet Union tried to bring the Congo under their sway with a liberal move. The Soviet Union filled the power vacuum with a man called Lumumba, who was bribed with arms, luxuries, women, gin, hashish as premier. With his Soviet and Czech diplomats and technicians who swarmed all over the Congo, Lumumba was able to control the Congo elections. Lumumba unleashed a communist reign of terror against the populace, murdering and torturing men, women and children. At the same time, Katanga was a stable province of peace and stability, racial, tribal and class harmony, and Mozi Kapende Toshombe, the de facto ruler, declared independence from central Congo at the time. I am succeeding from chaos, he declared. He was making a clear stance of a newly independent African territories capable of self-rule. The so-called Russian leader, President Khrushchev, immediately declared him a traitor to Congolese sovereignty and the US liberals echoed his cry. Kremlin and the USSR supported a revolution to get the UN to send troops and assist Lumumba to terrorize and subdue the people. So what was so horrific about the stance of Toshombe? Did he provide a roadmap for others to follow that could threaten the totalitarian control the power brokers sought to achieve? What they stood for could not be tolerated by the forces of anti-colonialism in the Kremlin or the US so-called State Department, the Western news media, and especially the UN. The nation was peaceful for just one week, until July the 14th, 1960, when the US joined with the USSR in support of a UN resolution authorizing the world body to send troops to the Congo. These troops were used not to stop the bloody reign of terror being visited on the rest of the Congo, but to assist Lumumba, the chief terrorist in his effort to subjugate Katanga. Within four days of the passage of that resolution, thousands of UN troops joined the campaign. The tax burden was on the people of the US, but the real cost was the lost lives, freedom and suffering of the Congolese. The UN and its cohorts deliberately bombed Katanga's schools, hospitals, and even churches, while UN troops machine gunned and bayoneted civilians. 46 international doctors in the city of Elizabethville, now Lubumbashi, in Congo from Brazilian, Belgium, Spanish descent, fired off telegrams to the UN pleading for a ceasefire. They issued a report indicting the UN for atrocities on the citizens. In the city, during three major campaigns, the Red Cross were bombed and shelled by the UN. Katanga was overwhelmed and forced back under so-called communist rule. The same doctors witnessed attack 
after attack on the Red Cross ambulances by the UN mercenaries. Regret your odious lie constituted by the statement that UN mercenaries do not fire at Red Cross ambulances and others. Stop. You would be authorized to speak after spending the night with us in hospitals bombarded by your shameless and lawless ruffians. Telegram to the UN. The UN declared no civilians were hurt, yet so-called Professor Ernest van der Haag said, it is hard to speak as I did, with a mother whose husband was killed at home in her presence with bayonets by UN soldiers. The campaign was declared a resounding success by the UN, and in 1982, a propaganda film, Congo, declared we achieved what sane to do, not just establish reorder and peace, but also technical support for a new infrastructure and rebuild a new country. So-called Lord Colton, in his Hansard report to the so-called HMR declared, many incidents occurred then are violations of the rules of war of the Geneva Convention. Although deliberate shooting of civilians certainly occurred, the incidents mainly related to the killing of prisoners of war or attacks on Red Cross ambulances. Under this heading, I include not merely murder, but rape, assault and looting of property. I am convinced the answer is to withdraw the United Nations troops, first from Elizabethville and secondly from the whole of Katanga, when I believe complete peace and quiet could soon be restored. On the other side of the world, the picture is no less bleak. So-called President Suharto of Indonesia had been welcomed back into the fold of the UN on September the 29th, 1966. The so-called nation of Indonesia was seen as the greatest prize in Southeast Asia to the capitalists and the Western power brokers who wanted their piece of the pie, despite the slaughtering by him of 500,000 of his own people, dropping them into mass open graves. He was also the founder in 1967 of ASEAN, a super state for the region, and then set about the 1976 annexation of East Timor, despite disapproval from the West. Indonesia used the excuse of a common brotherhood to invade, but Timor was religiously and culturally distinct. East Timor, it seemed, was beyond the reach of TV and satellite and experienced the worst slaughter relative to population in history, an ethnic conflict the UN failed again to prevent. The US sponsored Suharto slaughter, providing 90% of arms to Indonesia for the invasion, with Henry Kissinger secretly enhancing the flow of arms to the aggressors for genocide in Timor. He feared Congress would find out about his complicity with Timor and said, it will come out that Kissinger overruled his pristine bureaucrats and violated the law. How many know about this? He commanded arms to be stopped quietly, but secretly started again in January. As killings increased, arms shipments doubled. The US wanted things to turn out like they did. The task was to render the UN ineffective to impede Indonesian aggression. By the 1980s, media coverage in the New York Times was shaming Indonesia, stating they were not doing enough to stop the atrocities. So what about the USA and the UN with a mandate to stop this genocide? Independent journalists were not welcome in Timor and a small group were killed in 1975 for trying to breach the wall of silence. After the invasion and occupation, 200,000 died, or one third proportionally more than killed under Pol Pot in Cambodia. The UN was rendered paralyzed to stop the rapacious invader Indonesia, who broke all provisions of the UN Charter. They defied 10 UN sanctions, resolutions calling to withdraw from East Timor. In the weeks and months immediately after that invasion, the UN Security Council and later the General Assembly called for the withdrawal of Indonesian military forces, but all of this fell on deaf ears. The so-called British ambassador to Jakarta, Indonesia, said we should keep our heads down and let matters take course. The Indonesian army did not withdraw until 24 years later. This dark secret was exposed. 
Never before have Indonesians been able to read in such detail about the mass killings that started in October 1965. Declassified U.S. Embassy cables and memos show not only how the massacres of alleged communists was orchestrated by Indonesian military leaders, but also how much the United States knew about it, kept silent and even offered help. These documents prove that the amount of people who were killed it was very, very high. These documents contradict the government's statements that only a few people were killed. Not only has the government yet to admit the massacre happened, discussing the events of 1965 remains dangerous 52 years later. Conservative groups recently attacked a gathering of survivors and activists with petrol bombs. Student Raisa Widiastri managed to escape unhurt. When the attack happened, I thought I was going to die for exposing the truth. Now they can only hope that these documents with detailed accounts of the mass killings will stop this denial. Australia's so-called PM celebrated with Indonesian delegates over champagne a mile high aboard a flight. This was in recognition of the annexation of Timor, saying they were too poor to become an independent state culminating in the treaty being signed to exploit the oil of the Timor Sea. The UN had overseen all of this on their watch. How is it genocidal atrocities seem to repeatedly occur on the UN's watch? The UN was sent to Rwanda in 1993 with a mandate only to try to keep peace and that no force would be allowed and push for disarmament with the target of moving to a power-sharing government. If the intelligence was accurate and warnings about an impending attack, then how did the UN intend to maintain order amidst such violence and chaos without a decisive military presence? In 1994, he warned the United Nations of the impending genocide, but was ignored. This plan of extermination was a deliberate action that we saw coming and we watched. Surely the so-called Houthis felt empowered to assault because of the weak mandate and presence of the UN. By Thursday 7th of April 1994 and in Kigali the killing was underway with government-backed militias and Rwanda's majority Houthi ethnic group armed with machetes moved unimpeded through the city with the so-called Tutsi minority in hiding. A deployment of only 2,500 UN soldiers only patrolled but did not breach roadblocks or stop the killing. 20 nations were represented from the Ukraine to Uruguay, but with no common language or joint training exercise, they were in chaos, by no means a united force. Bangladeshi medical corps were not even equipped with basic medical equipment, such as gauzes for wounds or basic painkillers. UN Force Commander of Canada called his political bosses in New York wanting more weapons and the authority to try to stop the killing. The UN Security Council duly voted not to augment the force, but even to pull out all but 400 UN soldiers. At the most critical phase, as the killing intensified, the UN had shown their true hand and the troops scrambled onto planes to leave Kigali. Jean-Paul Biramvu, a human rights activist who escaped the killing, said, We wonder what on earth the UN was doing in Rwanda. They could not lift a finger to intervene and prevent the death of tens of thousands of innocent people who were being slaughtered under their very noses. The so-called UN Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali later confessed, Unfortunately, I failed. It is a scandal. I'm the first one to say it and I'm ready to repeat it. By mid-June, half a million Rwandans had been killed. The UN had done nothing to stop the slaughter. It seems the UN had set itself up to fail and a genocide was the end result. Other cases indicate the corruption and inadequate management system of the UN. During the Gulf War crisis in 1996, the UN proposed an oil for food plan, despite sanctions on the filthy government of Bani Abbas, Iraq, 
This allowed for oil revenues to be deposited in a UN account and used for approved reasons such as food, medicine and commodities. The so-called leader Saddam Hussein siphoned 20 billion US dollars off this pot, even bribing a link man to Kofi Annan of the UN to take oil for food concession vouchers. Whilst at the same time he mocked the arms inspection process so it became impossible for the UN to conduct proper analysis, even forcing the UN out in 1998. And only US aggression enforced the inspection and covered up the failings again of the UN. Another case in hand reveals the incompetence of the UN, which has led to further tragedy. In 2010, the UN had established a core in Haiti, and a bacteria from Nepalese personnel was transmitted through drinking water via barrack sewage contamination. Another natural disaster, this one in 2010, was the earthquake in Haiti, and it was quickly followed by a devastating epidemic of cholera. Victims blame United Nations peacekeepers for bringing the disease to their nation. Now they filed an unprecedented lawsuit seeking billions. This is Haiti. With 10 million people and little access to clean water, the country was hardly prepared for a cholera epidemic. When I think about them, Paul told us, I know the pain they had to go through before they passed away. Paul is now one of those suing the United Nations for bringing cholera to the country, an epidemic that began after UN peacekeepers arrived following the earthquake in 2010. If the United Nations wasn't here in Haiti after the earthquake, would this outbreak have happened? No. And now the cholera has spread so far into the river systems that it would be impossible to eradicate. Forensic studies have linked the spread of the disease to a flawed sewage system at the UN's base for soldiers from Nepal. A UN test showed the culprit bacteria came from Southeast Asia. And up until 2010, they said they never had a problem. More than 8,000 have died in the last three years. The problem in Haiti is bad. It is the worst cholera epidemic in modern times. There are more numbers here than uh, probably even worldwide alone in this year. The UN says it has legal immunity and will not accept claims for compensation. More than five years after the initial outbreak of cholera, people are still dying. Throughout this time, the UN has steadfastly refused to accept any responsibility for the outbreak, despite allegations that its peacekeepers brought the disease onto the island and infected water sources through their actions. While stopping short of admitting full responsibility, the UN now accepts that it played a role in the outbreak. Over the past year, the UN has become convinced that it needs to do much more regarding its own involvement in the initial outbreak and the suffering of those affected by cholera. The partial UN backdown follows a scathing draft report by one of its own advisors, university law professor Philip Alston. Those who've seen the report say it states clearly that the epidemic would not have broken out if it wasn't for the action of the United Nations. The report goes on to state that the UN policy in Haiti is morally unconscionable, legally indefensible and politically self-defeating. For years, the UN has attempted to cover up perverted and outrageous behavior by various personnel in far-flung places as Angola, Cambodia, Eritrea and Somalia. Rape, paedophilia, prostitution and other forms of sexual exploitation and abuse have come to light in recent decades. I mean, the scale of this issue is very disturbing, isn't it? The report says hundreds of women have been made to trade sex for food, and it happened in several countries. Yes, and I have to say, I'm not surprised, though I find it deeply saddening, of course. Look, this is something that we have seen in many of uh, the countries of the world where the UN is operating, and it's been a problem that has been going on for many years. 
there is immunity from prosecution for peacekeepers that are deployed on UN peacekeeping missions, whether to Haiti or to Congo or to Liberia. If those peacekeepers commit crimes there, they cannot be held to account in those countries. They can only be held to account in their home countries. And far too often, this immunity is like a protective cloak around them, whether that is for sexual abuse, such as rape. And remember, a number of these cases that this UN report is highlighting appear to be underage children, so under the age of 18. So in many places, that would be statutory rape. And of course, then there's the other component of this, which is sexual exploitation abuse. So where peacekeepers are uh, entering into sexual relations with women, girls, sometimes with boys, who they then pay in exchange with food or medication or other things. Yeah. Those two issues are slightly separate, but both of them are going on. You felt that, that you were saving lives, uh, but that there was a big machine probably going against you and that sexual abuse is not something the United Nations is really concerned about. I saw that I would have the support of the UN and curiously I did not. I mean, not only I had to fight the traffickers, which was in my job description, but I had to fight the UN, New York, who was absolutely against what we were doing. Why? I don't know, maybe because, you know, it's, uh, I don't know how to say in English, le repos du guerrier, boys will be boys. And I saw that I was um, trying to stop their blue helmet from exerting the right of men. I don't know. and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. The UN's impulse is clearly to protect the perpetrators, providing a cloak of impunity for crimes and abuses. That leaves the people who most need protecting the vulnerable, the disabled and impoverished exposed to grave harm at the hands of the UN peacekeepers sent to keep them safe. Of course these matters encompass the aspects of human rights and the council responsible for this it seems is far from fulfilling its role. The UNHRC, which includes the likes of China and Saudi Arabia, it seems needs to get its own house in order before addressing others. The so-called government of China's track record is appalling with abuses against religious ethnic minority groups and an inability to tackle the issue of forced labor and organ trafficking. Concluding that organs are forcibly removed from prisoners of conscience in China, an international tribunal delivers its final judgment. Doctors killed those innocent people simply because they pursued truthfulness, compassion and forbearance in the case of Practitioners. The tribunal found that Falun Gong practitioners were the main source of supply, but more recently evidence shows mass medical testing of the Uyghur ethnic minority. Does anyone think that there would be a million and a half people detained in concentration camps in Xinjiang right now if the world had stood up and stopped what was happening to Falun Gong? Well, the filthy so-called government of Saudi Arabia has been suppressing women's rights for years. The state has executed 48 people in the past four months, half of them on non-violent drug charges and still has been re-elected to the Human Rights Watch of the UN. Surely it is tantamount to taking someone who physically and emotionally abuses their partner and granting them the position of a relationship counsellor. Another key issue embedded in the UN strategy is the enforcement of sterilization at home and abroad, and often without consent. What goal lies behind this plot? In East Timor alone, the UN oversaw the compulsory injection of the contraceptive drug Deprovera, which had been forced onto teenage school girls, and if questioned they were lied to and informed it was anti-tetanus. According to a 1993 study, 30% of women of childbearing age were coerced into taking this drug. In the 1980s, so-called President Suharto of Indonesia received the UN Prize for supporting family planning and a bonus check for 12,000 US dollars. 
Many Timorese families became aware and would not go to Indonesian clinics as the unborn baby would be killed. Suharto boasted of his New World Order plan would send immigrants from Indonesia to Timor in an attempt to dilute the native population. Not so far away across the South China Sea, China has undergone a human rights disaster with its own population control strategy. It is not the UN Population Fund's mission to provide access to safe, voluntary family planning to women around the world. What kind of influence have they provoked in China? Since 1979, the one-child policy was enforced in China and the penalties for violating this law range from severe fines to forced abortions and even sterilization. The one-child policy also led to a surge in female infanticide. Beijing has vowed to hunt down and punish officials who forced a seven-month pregnant woman to have an abortion in a case which sparked outrage throughout the world. Feng Jianmei, who is in her 20s, was forced to sacrifice the child in early June after breaking China's strict family planning legislation. The so-called U.S. State Department noted the U.N. fund partners on family planning activities were the so-called Chinese government agency responsible for these coercive policies, and that in turn, the U.S. State Department's funding had previously contributed to this campaign. The apparatus of coercion was constantly being built out, strengthened and incentivized through money so that people would even turn in their neighbor who turned out to be pregnant without authorization by the state. U.S. Congressman, Republican Chris Smith. Another offshoot, the UN Joint Staff Pension Fund and its clandestine operations reveals a dark secret. The agency serves 205,000 current and previous UN employees, yet its holdings are shrouded in secrecy. Even the board of directors don't know where all the funds are channeled. David Pred, executive director of Inclusive Development International, said, as one of the least transparent pension funds in the world, neither its beneficiaries nor its board of directors or the public at large, whose taxes bankroll the UN, are allowed to know where it invests its 64 billion US dollars pot and that it hides the vast majority of its investment portfolio from the public flies in the face of the UN's commitment to transparency and accountability. Pred wrote in an email, the fund must bring itself into line with the rest of the financial world and the UN's stated values and disclose all of its investments now. Is it any wonder when in 2014 the UN JSPF financed and helped the establishment of two exchange-traded funds or ETFs, designed to channel investments to companies actively working to lower their carbon emissions. The combined value of the assets managed by the two ETFs is 677 million US dollars, with 1% of the shares active in West Bank companies. Yes, you heard it clearly. The UN is holding investments in companies operating in the illegal criminal Zionist regime settlements situated in the West Bank. The largest of the controversial investments is 2.3 million US dollars in shares held by LOWC ETF, which is a Zionist financial institution documented by Human Rights Watch to have provided loans for housing developments in the illegal criminal Zionist entity Israeli settlements. This facilitates the transfer of settlers in direct violation of Article 49 of the 4th Geneva Convention, a war crime prosecutable at the International Criminal Court. All companies in the report have been persistently reported to the UN human rights bodies in relation to ongoing violations of international human rights and humanitarian law. The revelation that the UN holds investments in companies operating illegally in Palestinian territories carries a particular irony, given that the UN has an entire humanitarian relief agency dedicated to Palestine. As of December 31, 2017, the agency UNRWA had an operating budget of 634 million US dollars, almost as much as the combined value of the two ETFs. 
Why have the UN and its subsidiaries continually failed to live up to the public expectations and responsibilities? Agenda 21. In such a despairing world, the propagandists have worked hard to deceive and wrap up the agenda with empty platitudes in a way that you want to hear and can't even argue with. They offer in their enlightening manifesto of no poverty, zero hunger, clean water, sustainable cities, responsible consumption production, ending inequality and world peace, justice, with a matching PR speak to achieve these ends. Of course, the key tagline they often fail to mention is that we cannot achieve these goals without a global totalitarian subjugating power to do it and full complicity. Are all the tentacles of the UN working towards a common goal? Is there an endgame in their sights? Agenda 21 manifesto seems like a final solution to consolidate power with the CFR UN axis that in the parent has been created to find solutions for an environmental global crisis that is leading to drastic change in political arrangements. War and the threat of war are catalysts. Political turmoil. National security. Climate change. Climate change. Humanitarian crises. Violent extremism. The drug war. The women's rights. Nuclear proliferation. When I look at the trajectory of the 21st century, we don't have the luxury of saying nuclear proliferation or climate or terrorism or anything else is the next existential threat. It's, it's going to be a, a crowded agenda. If you want to live in a society that is receptive to new people and ideas and commerce and travel and globalization, it means in a world of, you know, seven or eight billion people, something's going to happen. And what we want to do is start a conversation in this country about the need for Americans to be better prepared for the world they're about to enter. We've raised all the money to come here ourselves, to come 5,000 miles to tell you adults you must change your ways. The UN Earth Summit was a watershed for the globalist agenda, and in 1992 it declared a need for major changes in governance, giving the illusion of a democratic choice, with non-government organizations lobbying for tougher measures. The principles that came out in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, were penciled out by the CFR long ago. The NGO movement, with their indigenous activities who appeared at the summit, is a global renter mob. The same faces show up everywhere, from the mountain tribe to the rainforest dweller, repeating the same stock phrases. We are exerting our rights and that to be heard is an exercise on global democracy. The UN is funding them to make one worlders look more conservative, less radical, and to give a voice to the common people. Maurice Strong, the so-called Secretary General of the UN and friend of Al Gore, made the point patently clear to all those with ears to hear. The only hope for the planet and industrialized nations is a collapse, and our job is to bring it about, using the idea of saving the environment to justify the end of the democratic process. The plan is to be introduced at a local council level so people don't see the bigger picture unfolding. A Trojan horse for world fascism, you might ask. As commentators such as Dr. R. Muller, former UN Secretary General and founder of the so-called University of Peace in Costa Rica, noted he had a mystical vision of the United States of the world. The policies mentioned clearly ratify the evidence we have provided for what the UN have been involved with in the last 50 years or more. The end to national sovereignty in the formation of superstates such as the EU and ASEAN. The dilution of indigenous communities, e.g. the Katanga and Timor-Leste, and forced migration from Indonesia. The open border immigration crisis fostered by war and economic disparity in Syria, and global control of the means of production and farming. Social re-engineering through the restructure of the family unit with the state to manage the raising of our children. And this is to stop home education and removal of children from families, as in Germany and Norway today. The plan for newly designated settlement zones in megacities with high-density micro-apartments and 24-7 surveillance. 
The real message, like all the UN manifestos, remains cloaked in the summary notes of the agenda. And the effective execution of Agenda 21 will require a profound reorientation of all of human society, unlike anything the world has experienced before. A major shift in both priorities of both government and individuals. And there are specific actions which are to be undertaken by every person on the earth. Is there any knowledge from the past generations to indicate any army wearing blue helmets and what their true intention would be? The armies of the Dajjal, the great deceiver of mankind, will carry blue helmets. The army of the Dajjal, the greater deceiver of mankind, will have blue headgear, helmets or hats. Both are narrations from over a thousand years ago in Islamic texts. We as a people have become anaesthetized and distracted by bread and circuses, and the results are self-evident. It seems the idea of a UN with a strong peacekeeping presence, an ideology of justice, helps to alleviate the guilt we feel for neglecting the chaos and tyranny that overwhelms a multitude of nations today. However, if they have no substantive power or strength to stand up to moral and economic corruption, oppression of the vulnerable and innocent, and to dictate how we educate our children, even genocide, then how is this anything more than lip service? It seems the end goal is an instrument of technocrats created by an unelected body with a supranational authority beyond the reproach of nations and peoples. As Plato succinctly said, if you do not take an interest in the affairs of your government, then you are doomed to live under the rule of fools. UNGA Resolution 3379, the so-called Zionism is Racism Resolution, mocks this pledge and the principles upon which the United Nations was founded. And I call now for its repeal. Zionism is not a policy. It is the idea that led to the creation of a home for the Jewish people to the state of Israel. And to equate Zionism with the intolerable sin of racism is to twist history. To equate Zionism with racism is to reject Israel itself, a member of good standing, the United of the United Nations. The Black Banners of the East Satellite Channel. Visit our website, alrayatilsud.org, for more information about our call. And subscribe today to our official YouTube channel for daily online videos.